Okay, so you want me to show socks real fast and then jump straight in? <laughs> show socks. So if this is the first time you're watching a video or joining us, Matt shows the socks. So it I, is a whole hour. So. I don't. <laughs> we're just gonna stare at my socks all out so to be honest with you i'm not gonna lie i uh i every time uh it's the day of the webinar i look in my sock drawer and i go what socks part of me wonders which socks have i already shown which ones have i not i know that not all my socks end up on youtube so it's probably fine um, and today i didn't go with anything fancy i honestly just went with comfortable and i liked the color scheme and so like these socks are like nice. honestly really thick, which I don't usually love thick socks, but they're just super comfortable and have fun like pastel colors. And so uh, that's what I went with today. And I, I may have already shown these, but I think I showed it doesn't matter. Socks twice now. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's all good. Yeah, so it's, it's just, all good. This, this is what was the mood of the moment. So. It was yeah, the mood of the moment. And we just and we just flow with that. Mm -hmm. um as far as so now i should probably jump into uh teaching stuff right that'd be awesome okay so i um yeah um that was me screaming because it my thing fell uh, <laughs> there i wanted to get the right angle okay so um <laughs> uh i after last session um, I think about all the time, like, okay, what am I going to share? Uh, what, are, what are we going to do for the webinar? What topic are we going to bring up? <clears throat> and after last session, I actually received an email from somebody who shared something. And I have spent the last two weeks, honestly, thinking about it and figuring out what's the best way of going about it. And I don't know that I have an answer. I didn't get explicit permission from this person to share it, but I won't reveal anything. Um, I won't share any names or anything like that. And I, I may even change it just slightly. Um, but basically it was said that I talk about needing to go deeper. Um, and I, and I do, I talk about that regularly. Uh, there was a brief mention about still face um and which we had talked about last time the still face video with uh ed tronic i'd encourage you guys to go watch it and that they feel like this happens uh in their relationship the still face happens from the addicted partner and that um they've even admitted using it as a punishment perhaps um and this person asked me and i i honestly have read it several times they basically told me to go deep told me to get deeper and i and i don't exactly know uh what that would look like in a webinar situation and it was a plea we need real men to get real uh with basically other men who didn't have good examples of how real men should be um the the problem is and this i am i am quoting not enough men get real with other men on behalf of us women who are who love and don't get the love in return and you know i have thought a lot about this and i can do there's a couple of things that come to my mind one of me part of me wants to know how exactly uh, to, uh, and I asked this question of myself, how exactly do I model? I think on here, I do show emotion. Um, you know, obviously there's the clinical side of me that, uh, shows up as a clinician, if that makes any sense. Um, I'm not getting on here and sharing my personal story a ton because there's a, it's questionable if that's always, the best thing from a therapist, uh, from a clinician, even though I'm not acting as a clinician on here, if that makes sense. <laughs> I feel like that was just a little bit of uh, uh, legal stuff I was throwing out there, but uh, um, trying to play it safe. But at the same time, um, I'd be curious on, you, I, I want to validate you, the person who sent this, I want to validate you that you are not wrong. 
In fact, I don't think enough men get real with other men. Um, and I don't know that that's exclusive to men, but I do think men have a bigger struggle with it. I remember reading something a while back that uh, I don't remember if it was a study, if it, you know, I don't remember the specifics of it, but it was suggested that men are allowed to, in society, Western culture, that we're allowed to feel two things. Men are allowed to feel anger and sexual, which is funny because sexual isn't a feeling. Um, it's not an emotion, but we're allowed to be angry because it's manly. Uh, and, and obviously there's a lot of women who are probably hearing me. I hope you can hear it in my voice that I don't agree with that. I don't think anger is manly. Um, in fact, I think there's a lot of women who maybe uh, don't show anger. Uh, and I, in fact, I've had women tell me that uh, if they're ever angry, they are referred to as a bitch. And, and, and so women aren't allowed to be angry because now they're um, you know, automatically categorized like that. And I don't, um, obviously that's not healthy. So with men, with, with men, um, anger is often that only emotion that we, uh, are allowed to be allowed to feel and allowed to have because it's the only manly emotion. Fear isn't manly. Sadness isn't manly. And as crazy as it sounds, joy isn't manly, right? Don't be too excited. When can men show joy? Men can show joy when they're uh, playing a sports game and they score a touchdown or, you know, and they they do this activity that it's like, yeah, I can I can we can we can touch each other's butts. Then it's OK, but we can't do it any other time. Right. We can't hug any other time. Right. We very st strict on when men are allowed to show emotion and um, in our partner relationships, uh, not allowed. With our children, with friends, not allowed. I had a friend the other day who told me uh, he's finally understanding what I mean when I tell him how much I crave connection. And he says, I've never, I never felt like I'm allowed to, to show any emotion. Otherwise, I'm a pansy. Um, and so we talked about that for a little while. So as far as the email, how exactly, I love it, you're asking me, please, Matt, please, as a man, show and model for other men uh, how to do that. I'm, there's a part of me that questions, how do I do that in a webinar situation? Um, and so I'll throw that out and ask you guys, what are your thoughts there? Throw that in the questions or ask me questions. Let's talk about it. But then there's the other piece uh, I can do some teaching. So one of the things I recommend, um, I've seen the, the my men who are struggling with addiction have often used the excuse, and I, and I say that clearly, they've used the excuse that when I go to 12 step, when I go to therapy group, I'm told that I'm not allowed to share what is happening there. I have to keep confidences. So they will go home to their betrayed partner and their betrayed partner who loves them and wants to be close and wants to feel emotional intimacy says, how was your meeting tonight? How was group? What did you learn? And they say, oh, not allowed to talk about it, right? And that is an excuse. I want to make it very, very clear, men who are listening to me, that is not okay. There is nothing about that that, that is okay. You, you cannot reveal information about somebody in the group, but you, you would do so much in your relationship if you said to your partner, somebody shared something that really impacted me. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know how to cope with it, or I'm overwhelmed. It, was a, it brought up a lot of sadness for me, or it brought up a lot of hurt, or more likely, it brought up a lot of anger. I was angry for that person, or I was angry at their parents, or I was angry at their spouse. And then why? Why were you angry? And, and it might be, I don't know. Okay, well, try and explore it. Why am I angry? I'm angry because 
it was hard to see how much they were hurting. I'm angry because it reminded me of how much I've been hurt. I'm angry because uh, I felt I was treated this, uh, similarly by my friends or my parents, or they expressed it in a way that I've never felt like I could express it and it helped me feel it. And now I'm angry that I've had to go through this, right? Whatever is going on, you need to try and explore through 12 step therapy groups, individual therapy, all of these emotions happen, even if the only thing you are feeling is anger. Or a question I'll throw out is, if you do feel sexual, ask yourself, why? Because I'm lonely, right? Well, that's a hard thing to say. Hey, I'm feeling sexual because I'm lonely. Heaven forbid I tell my spouse that I want to connect with you, right? That's a scary thing for a man to say. Why would I tell you I'm lonely or ask for sex, especially if I've betrayed you through sex, to have you reject me? I would rather not say anything and not deal with rejection and hope I get it in return. Now, again, these are not excuses. I'm just trying to walk through the thought processes. So if you can tell your spouse I'm, I'm lonely or I've been feeling really disconnected. That's being vulnerable. Now, would I rather you tell your spouse you're lonely? Would I rather you tell your spouse that uh, you're feeling distance and you want to be closer? Of course, share all that. So emotions are incredibly difficult and going deeper is a daily practice. Get an emotions chart. Do a search on Google for chart of emotions and find one that you like just to get vocabulary. Record every 15 minutes throughout your day, which you're probably not gonna do, but uh, it, multiple times a day, check the emotions chart. And when you recognize there's an emotion that you're feeling, even if it's only anger or frustration or irritation, which is all in the anger category, by the way, check that in with your spouse. What are you angry about? Somebody cut me off. Why does that make you angry? <laughs> you know, try and explain why that makes you angry. Try and search yourself. Well, because I shouldn't be treated that way. Really? How often do you feel like you're treated poorly? Talk about that. And, and none of this has to do with the betrayal trauma. None of this has to do with the stupid mistakes you've made in trying to survive with an addiction. Share all of this information. Start with basic stuff so that you can let your partner into your inner world. More than anything, your partner wants to know how you think, how you feel, because that's what intimacy looks like. True emotional intimacy looks like that. So invite them in by starting to open up about the simplest little observations about life, about yourself, about your emotions, about how you feel things in your body. Oh, I'm feeling my, my fists clench up. I felt my jaw tighten, right? I felt a lump in my throat. Just share those. All of these things help you go deeper and help you invite somebody into your inner world, which is what your partner deserves and craves. So I think that's all I got for right this second, Tammy. Talk to me. Yeah, that's yeah, but I, I love that. And I and I like that you're talking about the body check-in too. I think if we start tuning into what our body is telling us, we're better in touch with what the emotions are. You know what I mean? Like it's not just anger, it, um, it's hurt or gosh, I'm feeling relaxed and I'm feeling some joy. There's a new one, you know, that, so checking in with your body as to, you know, like, like if you can't check in with your emotions, like, you know, I agree, get the chart. And I learned for me that anger was a great cover for hurt. I like anger because it's powerful and outward directed yeah. and hurt is like, Oh, you know, and, and so, um, you know, but also keying in to not just what, I'm feeling, you know, but starting to look at what others are feeling and partners for one, but you know, if you've got kids, what are your kids doing They They show emotion 
because they haven't, you know, especially young ones haven't learned to tamp it all down. They haven't been trained to not have emotions and not, you know, girls don't get mad, you know, boys, oh. boys only get mad, you know. Um, uh, so, so I think that if you can start looking at other kids faces and seeing, you know, what they're displaying, you also start going, oh, there's, there's more to this world. Yeah, and kids don't have the ability to regulate emotion like we do. I often teach parents like it's really important for us as a parent to model for our kids emotional regulation because that's where they're going to learn what emotions are appropriate, which one, you know, when those emotions are appropriate. And so that's, I mean, it's interesting. You're in the middle of the store, your kid innocuously asks you a question. Hey, can I get this candy bar? No, not right now. And next thing you know, and you're like, what is happening? Right? Like, I don't understand. Right. And it's, you know, if you could get them to explore lately, they feel like they haven't been heard and understood. And that would have helped them feel really special. I'm not saying buy your kids candy bars every time they ask, but it's like our children don't know how to regulate. So I love that, Tammy, when we pay attention to children in their authentic environment, if you will, they don't know how to regulate. They just let it go. Whatever's happening. Now, that's not always a positive, but we didn't learn as children how to let that out. In fact, we learned to shut it down, lock it up, close it up. And, and we have to actually learn how to go back and teach that little kid inside of us. It's okay to feel emotion and here's how. So, and I think I was going to say, and when you talked about, you know, guys having the, um, a sports analogy, it's like, yeah. I can feel excited. I can feel joy. But yeah. it's also accomplishment. So like if I've achieved, right. then I can feel joy. So it's, right. it feels like joy is attached to a task well done. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Which so, is sad because yeah. it doesn't need to be. Yeah. We don't have to achieve something in order to feel joy. Yeah. You, yeah. You I mean, I, go ahead. You had, you had mentioned earlier um, that anger was like a safe place for you to go. And oh, yeah. And it's interesting because I, I always want to teach this. Anger gets a bad rap. Sometimes we think anger is always a cover up. And the truth is it can be a secondary emotion when we are trying to hide fear or sadness or hurt uh, or even joy, right? Any, any emotion that's hiding behind it, that's when anger is a secondary emotion or a cover up. And, and a lot of people struggle to know when is health, when is anger healthy, right? And I, I, this is something I try and teach all the time. If I see somebody else being treated unfairly, if I'm being treated unfairly, if I see injustice happening in the world, if I see somebody else being hurt or victimized, anger is a healthy emotion because it lets us know that something is wrong and needs to be stood up for. Um, anger is a healthy emotion when something's been taken from us that didn't deserve to be taken. And so anger is a totally healthy emotion for us to experience because it's standing up for something that is wrong, if that makes sense. Yes, and, it, and I think I've learned to understand that, but, but I'd have this like white hot rage that felt so out of control and for me, like it, it was, I just didn't want to have to deal with the hurt. And so as I was able to identify why I'm feeling hurt, you know, and, and I unpack the layers of that. So going deeper was for me, unpacking layers of things and understanding, oh, that's, you know, poking this wound. Oh, well, okay. So, but, but then I'm able to look at it in a more logical way and go, yeah, you know, you deserve to feel hurt. That was, that was hurtful. And, you know, they probably didn't mean it. Some of them do, but you know, like you can lodge it. You, I could at least use my executive brain instead of my white hot rage and, you know, want to, want to retaliate or, you know, I mean, I can make up a thousand stories of like really not nice things, you know, so it's better for me to be able to process through it and understand what's really underneath it when there is something underneath it. Absolutely. And that's not easy to do because that's where we start getting vulnerable. And think about this. Anytime we get vulnerable, we're risking. And what are we risking? We're risking rejection. We're risking betrayal. We're risking um, abandonment, neglect, right? We're risking all of that. We're risking loss. 
we're giving somebody else the power to actually hurt us. And that's the scariest thing about being vulnerable is, is all of that risk. The problem is if we don't risk, and this is the thing that I try to grab people and shake them. If you don't risk, you don't have intimacy. If you don't have intimacy, you don't have inner peace. You don't have connection with other people, right? You don't have the, the, you don't get rid of the longing and the, the loneliness. So it is so imperative that we learn to risk. Yes, because keeping siloed, you know, I, I always think keeping siloed. my Kevlar, yeah, keeping my um, Kevlar vest and protective armor on keeps me away from all the people that I really care about. So yeah, I won't get hurt, but I also won't be, you know, intimately connected with people that I care about, you know, that I want to care about. So, so I, I lose out if, uh, if I'm not willing to step into that space, you know, I'm the big loser. So I, I didn't hear your mic breaking up, so. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but anyway, um, but I'm sitting in a patch of grass. What do I know? So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I want you guys to throw it out, like any questions. Um, I mean, I'm sure Tammy and I can keep, keep chatting, but like, talk to me a little bit, ask me, um, ask me questions and let's, let's try and explore some of this. If you're struggling with addiction yourself, what, where, what are your barriers to being vulnerable, to going deeper? What are you noticing is preventing you from going deeper? <clears throat> a lot of my betrayed partners, if I ask them that question, they're like, I'm the one always going deeper. And so what's preventing me from going deeper is I don't want to keep getting hurt. And so that's what we often refer to as like a burned out pursuer, right? Your betrayed partner feels burned out and doesn't want to keep pursuing because it's just going to be more and more pain. So they start to distance themselves. And the best thing that, that somebody struggling with an addiction can do is to start to be vulnerable and give that burned out pursuer that precious water in the relationship of vulnerability. They crave it, they need it, and they deserve it. And I think it's fair to say what's the absolute worst that can happen if I'm if I take this very brave step of of being being willing to be vulnerable and share what my identify what my emotions are and share them. What's the worst that can happen? Yeah, somebody can hurt me. Will I survive? Yes, I will. It can hurt, you know, and it's not going to feel good, but. But what's the best that can happen? We can grow in a, a more meaningful way. We can attach right. in a in a different way. I can have somebody that's really my partner, you know, standing side by side with me, not, you know, not keep looking at how do I not get hurt? So I was thinking also when you're talking about men, you know, and that women are more likely to um, uh, to be able to connect. That's not always true. I, I, you know, I have often said, oh, women you're right. Can be it's... the worst to women, you know, they, they, they can be just horrible to other Who? women. And, women and to so, women? Uh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I've said about the corporate ladder, you know, the, you know, the women are more likely to be, um, you know, taking their high heels. This is sounds, you know, sexist, but taking their high heels and stepping on the hands of the other women you know, that are trying to come up because we've clawed so hard to get up there rather right. than going, gosh, I worked really hard. Let me mentor you through, you know, and, you know, same when, you know, when the guys have an affair, they blame the other woman. Well, was she the only one that was doing this? Was she the one that betrayed you? No, he was, you know, so, so right. it's so complicated um, learning to find trustworthy people uh, that, you know, that you can be safe to share vulnerable feelings so that you have a safe space so you can really share the deep emotions that you know that's and I think one of the places we learn that is 12 step and you know I loved what you shared about you know, appropriate sharing of what I learned in 12 step how I was affected I never shared details but I have come home and you know shared about like wow that was a really right. emotional meeting for me and you know as somebody shared something really you know important it's whatever and so I share my reaction to it but like you said not the details you know of of you know, and same with you know group therapy or therapy or whatever gosh right. I do lots of different things but anyway it's um uh you know but all of those things you know I remember and I haven't I haven't needed group therapy in a long time I'd be totally willing to go back but but I remember coming home one night and I was gut-wrenching sobbing 
it, uh, I mean, it hurt. Oh, it hurt and so bad. That was the yeah, but that got to that. It, I, I was like, I was carrying around toxic stuff that that was like the most cleansing. I still remember I was, I mean, I, I, the whole, I have the whole, I remember. And that was the most cleansing thing I could have done. It was releasing these really deep emotions. And I've never felt that deep of a wound in yeah. like that again. So, yeah. but I had to be willing, you know, and supported to, um, to be able to step into that space. But oh, gratefully totally. I did, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, this next question, I, I'll actually touch on kind of what you're talking about there. Yeah. Uh, if we want to dive into the, into the question. Yes. Yep. How do I get in touch with my emotions without letting them overwhelm me? Seems like I'm either completely shut down or sobbing like a maniac. I can relate, but yeah. <laughs> no. no, I really did. It was the pendulum of like, you know, like yeah, the only time I was stable in the middle was when I was zipping through to the other side. Yeah. So it, it's challenging. Oh, it's so challenging. And to be honest, this, this may sound funny. I'm so glad that you are, that you asked this question. And my thought was that's such a, that's such a uh, a great question. And I almost want to say that's such a simple question. I'm not, I, I don't mean this in a bad way. Sometimes I need you guys to ask me questions that may seem really basic because I actually look and go, oh my gosh, that question is something so many people are asking. And so please ask me questions like this because I'm excited to respond and um, I wouldn't have thought of it. Um, but it's such an important one. So there, the, it is terrifying when you first start into recovery, um, when you start attending 12 steps and you go to groups, um, or you do individual therapy, right? You start getting in touch with the emotion and you do, you sob like a maniac, as you put it. And one, I'm going to tell you the more that you allow yourself to sob like a maniac, the more you're going to find yourself being able to manage that, if that makes any sense. So I've talked before about emotional tolerance and it's like anything else, right? Um, if you haven't gone and worked out your muscles lately, let's say you're a runner and you haven't run for a couple of years or maybe ever, right? And I told you, hey, go out and run uh, a mile, right? you'd be like, okay, I'll do it. And could you do it? Yes. Are you going to be sore tomorrow? You probably will be right. Um, but at the same time, someone who's running all the time, uh, I actually have been a runner in my past. I had a buddy ask me the other day, I need to run 15 miles. And I'm like, man, I haven't run more than six and a half miles for almost a year. And I said, fine, I'll go run with you. And to be honest, I made it just over 12 and then I was tanked and I, I made it all the way. I did all 15, but I was tanked. And it's that same concept. The, the only way we get ourselves to a place where we can manage emotion is by practicing experiencing emotion. And so for a while, it's it, you might have to say, I'm willing to go sob like a maniac, but I have to do it alone. And that's unfortunate, right? The best thing we can do is show our emotions with another person and let them witness. It actually can help increase our tolerance a lot. Um, but if that's what you have to do to allow yourself to cry, to allow yourself to feel, go do it because you want to build up that tolerance. Then try uh, sharing emotion with another person who you trust. Then try sharing it with several people you trust and start building up and working that muscle. You're gonna get less and less sore. It's gonna be less and less overwhelming the more and more you practice it. Um, and the other thing that can be very helpful is go where other people are feeling emotions. Um, go to the 12 step, go to group therapy, gr go to, I don't know, church, right? Find people who feel emotion and express emotion and learn to feel more tolerance. You will gain emotional tolerance for yourself as you gain it for others. Those work hand in hand. Um, and sometimes I'm not ready to feel emotion, but I can witness somebody else's emotion. So that can help. Um, another thing you can do, um, allow yourself to feel it and then have a plan to pull out of it. And that may sound a little bit funny, but 
it's like anything else. I'm not going to go run 15 miles if I haven't run in a couple of years, um, but I might go run five, right? Me personally, right? Like um, allow yourself to go do a little bit and then come back out. And, and so what that would look like might be for you to um, do like a meditation uh, that gets you, there's, you can do a meditation, getting in touch with your emotions. I can almost promise you, if you search YouTube, you you might be able to find one. Um, but, and then, and then do it for a minute, shut it off and then go work on something else and then do it for two minutes and shut it off and go work on something else. Um, watch a funny video on YouTube and laugh. It, it sounds kind of goofy because I'm telling you like find ways to distract but you're, you're purposely putting yourself into that emotion. And then you have an action to pull myself out. And I do this in therapy all the time. When I'm working with somebody on their trauma, one of the things we're taught is you don't dive straight into their trauma. You actually work on grounding tools. You work on them, um, you know, getting their life in balance. And, and over time, we go deeper and deeper and deeper into their trauma as they are gaining the tools to regulate all that emotion. And so um, you can <clears throat> uh, turn on some music that might change your mood, right? You can call a friend and say, hey, uh, you want to go hang out? You want to go play pickleball or something, right? Um, have plans for dipping in coming back out, dipping in, coming back out. And as you continually do that, you will feel your emotional tolerance uh, strengthen. And, and that way it's not so overwhelming. So uh, I could come up with other examples. Hopefully this gives you enough to kind of uh, understand the concept and play with it or ask me more questions. So. So, so I was thinking, I actually, I do, I, one of the things, it's a very dangerous thing for me to feel sorry for myself. And mm -hmm. so I had something big and it was, a, it was a real, I, you know, I, I kind of deserve to feel sorry for myself. So I set a timer. I allowed myself to feel sorry for myself for one hour. That was it. And then I went and I went and put blazing saddles on and I'm not promoting this as a, but like, it makes me laugh all the time. And I, and I knew it would. So I had one hour to feel sorry for myself. And then I went and did something that was, you know, that I knew would lift my mood, but you know, I'm very intentional. Um, uh, you know, uh, on my webinars the I mentioned to Matt at the beginning that, that my screenshots are all from when I'm out running, right. you know, I take a screenshot of sunrises. So I am intentional about when I'm out in nature. So one of the things that is really good for me, if I'm, you know, in a funky mood, if I go get out, if I, if I go up and I have to be intentional and look at whatever it is that's around me, I can't be just walking and feeling sorry for myself. So, so I love the idea of giving yourself some space, some limited time, setting a timer, um, doing the grounding exercises, mindfulness exercises. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I'm terrible at yoga, but I know so many people that, <laughs> oh. that, that I'm, I'm not stretchy. So it's one of those, <laughs> I know so many people that really find that healing and being in touch with your body, you know, I think that that really can start changing things, yeah. but, but giving yourself permission to experience it and not shaming yourself or making it be a bad thing, you know, I think is, I think it's critically important to, to clear the stuff out of, yeah. you know, that if we just shove it up on a shelf, that's, you know, that's why we as addicts, right. you know, keep numbing out because it's there, it's a pressure cooker, you know, oh, totally. and I think same for partners, if they're trying to, you know, hold everything and hold everybody's life mm. together, you know, it's still a pressure cooker. So we have to do things that are nurturing for us that will relieve the pressure, you know, and give us the bandwidth to be able to do life. Yeah, no, I love it. And, and it sounds, it sounds like you understand the concept and have, it's been part of your recovery. So that's great. Yeah. Well, there's some like feeling sorry for myself is a really bad one. I mean, like, well, I, it's just not a good place for me to go. No, to, feeling so sorry I, for ourselves isn't usually feeling emotion, right? That's more of a mutated emotion. Um, if I'm mm -hmm. feeling sorry for myself, um, then I'm more in a powerlessness place rather than actually, you know, why do I feel sorry for myself? Well, I'm sad that this thing happened or I'm hurting that I lost something, right? Then I can process the emotion around that instead of woe is me, my life's miserable, uh, I'm never going to be deserving of love, right? Those aren't emotions. Those are mutated emotions. 
Um, but there are times where I call a buddy and I'm, and I'll say it, I'm totally in a powerlessness place. I'm feeling sorry for myself and I'll process and work through it until I finally can get to the emotion, which isn't easy to get to at times where it's like, you know what? I'm really just hurt. I'm really just sad, but it's, it's a more vulnerable place to get there. And it takes time to learn how to move from that. But, oh man, I can yeah. totally relate to feeling sorry for myself for extended periods of time. Well, and I think you're right. It's a powerlessness, you know, and hurt, you know, mm -hmm. clearly I don't like to feel hurt, but, um, uh, but the powerlessness too, that, you know, like the, it's out of control. And as somebody who likes to have some um, more than a modicum of control over all things in life, it, it doesn't really happen that way. Um, you <laughs> yeah. know, I mean, it's challenging and, you know, and, and, you know, bad stuff happens to everybody. So, you know, like I get, I'm, you know, I, it, it, I, somebody said, you know, I didn't deserve that. And I thought, man, in my addiction, if I got everything I deserved, like, first of all, I'd be dead. But second of all, <laughs> you know, I'd be in jail or whatever else, you know, so, so thank goodness, I don't always get what I deserve. You I, know? I, and asked, I have a chance at doing something else. I heard somebody the other day say, I'm so glad I don't get what I'm so glad. Oh, how did they say it? I'm so glad I don't get what I deserve or what something about the fact that I've realized I can't like hope other people get what they deserve because I'm glad I don't get what I deserve. Right. Like it's that, it's yes. that funny space of like, yeah, the reality of it is if we all got what we deserved, it'd be pretty ugly. Yeah. Um, uh, like you mentioned earlier, the getting cut off in traffic, you know, and, and who knows what's going on in somebody else's life, but you know, like my instant action is, or my instant reaction is, you know, that person is a jerk. And then I thought, you know, I have been lost in, you know, and kind of going, Oh, I need to switch lanes or something. And, you know, I've done something unintentional. I mean, it was without, you know, without I, the intent of being hurtful. Yeah. yeah. I, so, I don't know that so I've everybody's ever supposed to understand that, you know, I don't know like, that I've ever know that that, like how many of us actually cut someone off because we want to be like i i want to show you that 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 I, that you know something's wrong with you like i i want to be a jerk to oh, somebody there are else. some yeah well it, it sure, depends which car would... i'm driving there are some <laughs> yes yeah so yeah. if i'm driving the car that's a little sportier like there are people that are in like i just know it you know and i just you know i know it's, it's not a competition i don't care it's so, so yeah. funny okay yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next question. My teammate will be home from treatment soon. I'm so thankful for the work he has done thus far. How can I best respond and support him when he is being genuinely vulnerable? How can I best respond and support him when he chooses not to be vulnerable or chooses not to open, be open and honest? Thank you both. Such a good one too. Um, so here's the hard part. I find that from betrayed partners, um, and because of the often unhealthy position that somebody struggling with addiction comes from, it's almost hard sometimes to go, wait a second, what you just said there was really vulnerable because oftentimes they can say things that sound mean or blaming, but there is vulnerability there. I'm not excusing it by any means, but you ask, what can I do? Try to listen for those moments where something is shared and ask yourself, was there any vulnerability there? And so um, it, it's hard because I wanna give an example and I'm gonna give an example that I think is otherworldly if somebody, a betrayed partner knows how to do this. Right. So I'm not putting it on the betrayed partner. I just want to be clear. I don't think you should expect to know how to do this. But imagine you're uh, the person who's betrayed you says something terribly insensitive, like, you know, I, I've had to go to my addiction because uh, I don't get my needs met and, and you don't meet my needs. OK. And terribly insensitive totally the wrong thing to do <clears throat> but if you can listen for the vulnerability the, if you were able to follow it up with wow so you have just felt so uncared for for so long and you just have not been able to get your needs met that you just felt like you had to go to the addiction and you didn't have any other choice man that's heavy right like i'm gonna do everything i can not to take that 
crap on, right? Meaning the truth is they're probably being vulnerable there in an angry, unhealthy way. And if I can like deflect that and say, I'm not taking that on, that ain't about me not showing up for your needs, right? That's not about me um, not being a good partner. That's about you being in a potentially victim place, if that makes sense, a powerless place and feeling you had no other choice. Now, if I bring all that up, there's a decent chance I'm not going to get more vulnerability. And, but, it, but it makes sense why we would. It makes sense why we would go to that space as a betrayed partner. So if you can listen for the vulnerabilities um, and point those out, wow, even if all you said was, wow, that's pretty vulnerable. And in your case, he might be like, it was. <laughs> right? Like, even if all you said, wow, that's really vulnerable. Or thank you for sharing. That, you know, like, just commenting that you're hearing them. And it might cause them to go, okay, what was vulnerable, right? Or they might give them insight. So you could try something like that. Now, in addition, let's say they're not being a mean person. <laughs> Other words are popping into my head. Let's say they're not being a mean person and they are being vulnerable in a much deeper way. And, and, it, and like you say, genuinely vulnerable. Um, that's a great time, honestly, just ask questions. Say, wow, um, I'm really glad you shared. Tell me more. Or if they share, you know what? Uh, I heard somebody in group tonight and it brought up a lot of anger. Really? Uh, how often do you feel anger when you go to group? What about what, what about what they shared made you angry or brought up anger? Um, does that, does the person you got angry for, do they remind you of anybody? Does it remind you of a family member, right? Like it sounds a little weird, but like asking questions can pull out a lot more vulnerability. Now you got to be careful uh, because I've heard people say, well, now I feel interrogated. And then, then you can say, if they say that you can just respond. Yeah. Kind of feels crappy to be interrogated. I can appreciate that. <laughs> so validate that even though you know you're not interrogating them you're just trying to pull out vulnerability so um but validating them is also an excellent thing like oh wow i can see why you feel that way or you know what i'm not sure why you feel that way can you tell me more right there's there's just be curious be honest about where you're at do your darndest not to go into a defensive place because next thing you know that just shuts things down but I totally get why as a betrayed partner, we do go to, to a defensive place. It feels like we're being blamed or whatever else. And then your next question, how can I best respond to support him when he chooses not to be vulnerable or chooses not to be open and honest? You know, that is, that's an amazing question that to me is such a hard one because I don't, Anytime I answer this question, I need to be clear that I'm not trying to put the burden on a betrayed partner. The, the, the burden of being honest and open is on, the, is on the person struggling with addiction. They have to have integrity. They need to learn to be honest. It may take time, but it is absolutely their burden. However, you can do things to help, um, even by saying, hey, I noticed that uh, you've been a little quiet lately. Are you, are you feeling okay? I noticed this is a time where you can often feel overwhelmed. Do you feel overwhelmed right now? Do you need me to give you space? And, and it, it may seem funny, but even asking this question, people who struggle with addiction, especially don't understand their needs and wants. And they might say, yeah, I need some space. Okay. What would that look like? Do you need to go for a walk? Do you need to go for a drive? Or I can head over to my friend's house for a little while. I was looking forward to seeing her or him or whatever. Um, is that the kind of space you need? Right? Like you're being supportive just by acknowledging that something could be happening from them. Um, you can also ask the question, hey, I know you lied to me yesterday and we've talked about it. 
Talk to me about why lying is something you learned to survive. Where did you learn to lie? Do you remember the first lie you ever told? And you might even say, I can remember the first lie I told, or I can remember lying to my parent because whatever, right? You can try to give some vulnerability to see if we can stir conversation. That can be really helpful in bringing out vulnerability. Um, but at the same time, you have to remember as a betrayed partner that it is not your job. It's not your job to be their therapist. It's not your job to try and get them to be vulnerable. If you want to try and help that process along, great. I think supportive friends and family can help me be vulnerable all the time just by asking the right questions. But do not take that on as your responsibility. It needs to be in the ownership of uh, the individual themselves. So I hope that helps. Tammy, anything else there? No, I think I think that's really true. And and um, you know, you having support for you, I'm glad you're here. It's like that. That's an you know, I'm glad you're here. There's lots of places for you to get support. You know, I, I mean, I hear I hear often from um, partners, you know, that their loved one has come home and things are are good, and I see he's more vulnerable. And then you know, they start going doing the waffling, and they start having the anger come back again. And you know, so so it's not a straightforward line, you know, of like, oh, now everything's going to be good. And we're, it's going to be back and forth. And, you know, as things come up and, you know, more is, you know, he, he has a bad day at work or something like that, you know, well, now I'm feeling vulnerable. So now I want to, you know, I want to go to my acting out, but I'm going to try really hard not to. Um, my husband has been very brave. Um, he has said, do you want to talk to, talk about this after you go for a run or after you go to your 12 step, you know, like, <laughs> like I, I mean, he's a brave man for stepping into that. Cause he could have gotten, you know, yeah. but I, you know, I, I love him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was going like, we will do better if I go for a run, go to my 12 step meeting, you know, whatever, if I go take care of myself. And then, you know, like I came back from one time, I came back from a run and I was, I couldn't even remember what I was like, you know, all bent out of shape about it was like, you know, of course, cause it, you know, my problems are mostly the biggest in, in here, in my brain, you know, right. most of the time. And so, so just having the ability to do something that takes me out of myself, um, you know, for me though, you know, part of it, I was like, yeah, it, like Matt said, it's not about you being there and taking care of him or, right. or being his sole support. He needs a community of like people. So, you know, that's why we have the drop-in groups for addicts. We have the drop-in groups for betrayed it, partners so that you each have your support. Yeah, if in your mind or in your partner's mind that that you guys are going to somehow be each other's support, you guys aren't going to make it. Like, there's just no way. As a betrayed partner or somebody struggling with addiction, like, you are not going to make it being each other's sole support. It just isn't going to happen. There's too much hurt and pain in there that you both need cared for, Um I mean, especially as a betrayed partner, if you're taking that on, oh, that's too heavy. It's not okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kinda and leads and in, he's kind of, kind of leads into our next well, question. Yeah. Where yeah, do I, just, where do I start? I just discovered my husband has been acting out, totally leaving a double life. So glad you're here that you started. Oh, oh totally. I mean, you, sounds like, you know, where to start. You started here. Um, and you know, if somebody, as somebody asked me this question, there's a couple of things that pop into my mind. Um, one, I'd find a therapist who specializes in the uh, addiction, addicting behavior that your, your husband has been having. And I would find somebody that is trained to work with betrayed partners um, because they're going to. And, and, and if you want help with that, email me, Tammy, yeah. T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com and let me know where you're located because they have to. To, they can only practice even during COVID uh, within their state licensure. So include yeah. that. But if you want referrals, email. Yeah. Me. Okay. Sorry Tammy's to interrupt. A, Tammy's a phenomenal resource on that, and it, it it she she knows a lot of people and can get you in in touch with the right ones. So totally reach out to her. Um, I so get somebody who's trained and can show up for you. Um, now depending on what your husband does, I mean, me personally, I think he needs to find somebody as well, right? But whether he does or not, 
go and get the support you need. Go and get somebody who can show up and specialize in your wounding uh, because you've been hurt. This is a terrible betrayal. And so that I would start there. I would also look for um, like support groups. Uh, the 12 the step support groups can be fantastic for that. Um, and just know that as you go and, and find people that there are a bunch of other hurt people in there trying to get help too. Uh, and just look around and, and try to show up and get the support you need, find a group that works for you. Uh, nothing's going to be perfect, uh, but uh, get in there and, and get that support there. In addition, um, I would look at your own personal support support system, friends and family who you feel like you could trust. And I would try and con confide in them. Um, uh, if uh, lots of people like to reach out to uh, spiritual leaders. And so if you have any spiritual leaders, that can be a great place to reach out um, or a spiritual support group. And lots of lots of different uh, church groups have their own 12 steps. So if you're if that's in, in your wheelhouse at all, that one can be very helpful. Um, but your main goal right now really needs to be focused on getting yourself grounded, getting as much support around you as possible. Um, because if you don't have the support, uh, and, 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 and I don't, I guess I'm going to say it this way, no matter how good of work your spouse does or doesn't do, your main priority should be taking care of yourself in this moment. Because of the injuries that you've had, you need to call 911 and go to the emergency room and get yourself taken care of um, and, and start getting that security and, and support around you. You won't be of any use to him if you don't. And, and again, my goal isn't to whether he does recovery or not, whether you end up staying with him or not make sure to get yourself taken care of. Once you start getting more secure and healthy and in a good place, uh, because you've been wounded, mind you, that's the reason you're hurt because of the betrayal of your husband, uh, then you can work on figuring out how can I now show up for him? And he needs to get himself healthy and start figuring out how to show up for you as fast as possible. So yeah, and, and you just had discovery, and I'm so sorry for that. I, I mean, oh. we really do understand. I mean, it, it's traumatic. So, um, so I, I love what Matt was sh sharing with the healthy boundaries. Like, what do you need to create safety for you? And, um, and I, I want to give one caution. He said finding help, helpful people that can be supportive of you. I would caution not just telling everybody because Correct. if you're sitting across the Thanksgiving table from all these people and they all know what he, did, you know, I mean, it can be very divisive yeah. or people I've had both where, where people were very supportive, get rid of the bum, but I've also had what was wrong with you that he did that. And so oh, you seriously. really do need to check, check carefully with who's going to be, you know, a safe place for you. Yes. That's why with the betrayed partner yeah. groups, I will share another resource too, because there's a group of women who created mm -hmm. we Tonglen, W E T O N G L E N.com. And that um, the, the, it's women only betrayed partners, you, you know, but they have done a very good job of supporting each other, providing resources as well. So, so there are some great resources on, on sex and relationship healing.com. We've got drop in groups, podcasts, Dr. Rob's podcast. I, I haven't checked in weeks and it had over yeah. 800,000 downloads. So, really good content. Um, right. The webinars like this, you know, Dr. Rob is on Monday night, uh, but there's a betrayed partner group and a men's group on Sunday night uh, yet as well. So, check all of those. Uh, and we've added a couple new uh, drop in groups as well. We've got yeah. work groups. Um, the next porn addiction um, 101 work group starts October 14th, and the next sex addiction 101 work group starts November 3rd. Those are on seekingintegrity.com. They're not therapy, they're not treatment but they're um, the psychoeducation so educational live facilitated and they can be a very helpful foundation component as well so yep and i and, okay. and i'll speak to what you just said you have um <clears throat> you have often if you're going to go to extremes it's either we don't tell anyone or i tell everyone <laughs> right and you have to find this balance. You can't do it without telling anybody. You, you, you need to find support. And so trying to figure out 
who can we talk about this to who will keep our confidences, who are still going to love us, whether I choose to stay with them or I leave <clears throat> and, and will still respect and, and love both of us, right? Like, and so it's this balance. I don't want to just tell everyone and put it out there as if I've been hurt. And so now I'm just going to let the world know that always isn't, that isn't always the most effective. And so finding that balance is, is really important. So I love that you mentioned that. And we can, I guess. Yeah, I, I know one, one woman who unfortunately made her husband stand up in front of church and confess it. Uh, you know, to everybody in the church and she and her children were also ostracized. So it like completely backfired on her, you know, for getting support for her, you know, in, in trying to make him be accountable. So, so it really is, you can't undo things. So, so getting support so you can think through, you know, mm -hmm. what you, what you want to do, what you want to say, who you want to talk to, right. you know, I know in the moment it's so tough, but you know, glad you're here. So, oh, totally. okay. Next question. It's I, actually this, this I think it's just, years ago. I think it's the same oh, person. And, okay. And okay. When he ended a seven year affair, I thought we moved on. I did 12 step for three years. We did some courses and a year of therapy and I'm like a deer in the headlights. What yeah. I hear in that is he stopped doing the things that worked. So yeah. it, like, well, like recovery is a lifetime journey. Mm -hmm. And it, like, if we went to therapy for a year and then he hasn't done anything, I'm, right. I'm honestly not surprised. So, well, mm -hmm. let me, I mean, let me, I'll speak to this. You should be a deer in the headlights, right? You went through the trauma already. You thought that you did, I mean, you did good recovery for yourself, I'm sure. And who knows what he did because he's not on here and so I can't ask him but I mean that that that's part of the question that I'm sure you're asking is was that real and if you did do recovery when did it go bad now I have no idea what state he's in but these are questions of course you'd be asking because now you're trying to figure out I went through it once I already worked through it uh, to, I don't know, I don't know you personally, but perhaps I've already forgiven you. I trusted you again. And you pulled this back out. You did it again. I mean, oh my gosh, the amount of confusion and pain that you must be experiencing. It's terrible. So you should be a deer in the headlights. In fact, you're a deer who got hit by the headlights. You're it, the, the headlights are gone. You got run over. This is terrible. And so you should be obviously having all of this hurt and doubt coming up. Now, we don't know the answers. You don't know the answers. He may not even know the answers at this point. And it may take a bit of work. And you've got to decide, can I go through this process again? And, 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 and I don't want to go through this process to have it happen yet again. So how do I know that this process is going to be the, any better? How do I know that this isn't going to happen again? And the truth is, we don't. Um, part of being in a healthy relationship is we risk and we and we uh, we allow the other person the opportunity to hurt us. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm saying that's every relationship that any of us have is we give the other person our vulnerability. We give them our heart. We give them our friendship and they have the ability to hurt us. He's hurt you once terribly. And now you're sitting here feeling like you're a deer in the headlights. You should. This is a this is a terrible double betrayal. And it and it's got to feel worse than the first time because you thought you could trust. You thought you let that go. You thought you forgave. Oh, my gosh. I'm proud of you for showing up and uh, trying to figure out how to heal. Good for you. I don't I don't know that. I, I have. Wanna, a oh, I want to add and please do not take on the shame of how could I not see this or what oh, did I do gosh. wrong or why? I'm, I mean, I hear all the time. I was an idiot for believing him. No, no, no you the bags are really, really, really good at gaslighting and blaming but, and making manipulating. And you want to believe that he's trustworthy. You want to believe but, he did his work. So this is not if, on you. But not just that. Like I look at it and I go, no, that's what that's what we commit to doing in our relationship is trusting people. You're not an idiot because you did what you were supposed to do in the relationship. Right. Like you're not an idiot for actually showing up how you originally committed to do so, even after a betrayal. That doesn't make you an idiot. That makes you a saint. Like, I hope that makes sense what I'm saying. Like, it doesn't mean that he doesn't deserve 
uh, that none of us deserve forgiveness, that none of us deserve an opportunity to, to co come clean and get whole. And, uh, but you're certainly not an idiot because you put your heart out there. That's beautiful. That's what, that's what the world needs more of, not less of. So good for you for having done that. And I, and I, and I'm, my heart goes out to you and, and I, I'll, I'm here. If you want to show up every second and fourth week, I'm happy to talk about it and answer any questions, but you're, you're doing the right thing. Just showing up and trying to figure out how to get whole again. No shame there whatsoever. I agree. So, so on that note, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks so much, everybody for uh, being here, joining us, asking great questions, grateful for all of you. So uh, Matt's colleague, Debbie um, McRae, will be on next week. Um, so we do have every Friday now uh, covered. So watch the schedule. Um, and we've got some other changes. So again, on sexandrelationshiphealing.com, all spelled out, you'll find the entire lineup and it changes. So keep checking in. So thanks, Matt. Great to see you. Yep. Good to see you too. Thanks, guys. Good job showing up today. Bye.